Hi, everybody. Betty here with your Signing Die Recap. I'm pretty excited about today's video update because I have with me today Becca Bailey, ACDHH's Community Engagement Liaison. So hi, Becca. Hello. I'm super excited you're going to uh, join me today. We're going to kind of dig through and talk about what all happened at the state legislature this year, right? Yep, absolutely. I'm really looking forward to what we have in store today. I've got some burning questions and I know the community is very interested in what's been going on over this past year. So we're really going to take this opportunity right now to dig in. I'm, I'm ready to get this going and start this discussion. I'd like to know if you can start off by describing some of the legislation that had um, passed and, and took place this past year and how it impacts the deaf, hard of hearing and deaf blind communities. Yeah, definitely. So one of the, uh, there's been a couple of bills. We were actually tracking this whole legislative session um, that specifically targeted the deaf, hard of hearing and deaf blind community. Um, the first one was Senate Bill 1092, and that was the bill adding statutory requirements to ACDHH. So added deaf blind to our uh, community members that we serve. Um, and then the second part, adding uh, to our legislative, excuse me, our statutory requirements, making legislative recommendations to the legislature for any future bills related to language acquisition um, for children and newborns who are deaf, hard of hearing, and deaf blind. The, the second bill, um, that we supported that specifically uh, targeted our, our community was the a ASDB um, bill, which was HB 2863. And that legislation um, we were very supportive of because it officially made ASDB a local educational agency. Um, so what essentially what that means is that they are treated under the law related to funding, um, issuing diplomas, being uh, fully responsible for the education of the children who attend ASDB, Phoenix, excuse me, Tucson campus and PSD. So um, they still have to do all the, you know, they still have the co-ops, they still have, you know, um, the other specialized services that they do and IEPs and 504s and all of that. But this really gave them a little bit more um, uh, authority over their, uh, their schools. And so we were, were very supportive of that. Wow. Sounds like really two significant pieces of legislation. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually looking forward to see how uh, that impacts us and, and what's to come. Also, can you tell me a little bit about some of the other bills that we as ACDHH had been monitoring? Um, maybe it was because we were in support of or very neutral or even opposed to. Um, if you could dive into that a little more. Uh, yes, I definitely can. Um, there were several pieces of legislation that we actually monitored throughout the hundred and some odd days of the legislative session. Um, one was HB, yeah. Wow. <laughs> it was a long session, but we can talk more about that in a second. Um, one of the bills that we very much were monitoring was the, uh, HB 2454. And that was a comprehensive telehealth, telemedicine legislation. And that was important to us because obviously when the pandemic hit in 2020, all the medical services went to uh, telehealth and you know the governor's executive order allowed for that to happen. But we saw direct impact um, on full and equal effective communication access for medical care through telehealth. Right. So we, as you know, right, we did a lot of publicity around that, around access. We wrote a white paper. 
So we actually got uh, connected with the stakeholders and the governor's office on that bill and talked to them about full and effective communication access on telemedicine and telehealth. So part of that legislation not only um, expanded and allows for telehealth to occur now officially in Arizona, but it also required a best practices telehealth advisory council. And that advisory council is required to determine what telehealth service, what services can be audio only and what services can be audio and visual only. And that is something that the advisory council is required to do. Now, here's, here's where we come in as ACDHH is we were uh, asked to be a legislative um, representative on that council. So in the statute, it says a representative from the commission for the deaf and the hard of hearing um, shall sit on that council to talk about um, and recommend best practices related to telehealth medicine and telehealth, uh, excuse me, and tele telehealth and telemedicine. So. Wow, that is wonderful. And it's so important for us to be at the table, to be able to provide that kind of consult for different issues specifically related to access. I'm really excited to hear about that information. Very, very cool. Definitely. And then another bill that we were monitoring um, and were so, uh, supportive of on the, on the we, we, we couldn't sign in and support, but we were supportive of what they were trying to accomplish and monitored the bill, which was the crisis standards of care um, bill. And this was another piece of legislation that came as a result of the COVID pandemic. Um, I don't know if you remember when last July, the resources in the hospital started getting really tight. Um, and there was all the news media around allocation of resources. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> unbeknownst to a lot of people is that the Department of Health Services has what's called a crisis standards of care plan. And what that means is in situations where resources are tight, the crisis standards of care plan must be initiated. And the disability community primarily came out in response to that crisis standards of uh, care before, you know, during that peak of the pandemic and asked DHS to amend the plan to ensure that individuals with disabilities um, were not, um, to put it bluntly, sacrificed uh, in those allocation resources. So, um, there was a lot of back and forth and then the uh, nothing had been done. So a, a legislation was dropped to ensure the protections of individuals with disabilities um, are not, the, the resource allocation um, cannot be based off of the fact that the person has a disability or that they have communication needs. Um, and so, that bill was passed and was signed into law. Um, we also heard that the Department of Health Services has already modified or will be modifying their crisis of standard care to include those provisions. Um, but now it's officially in law that no matter what in the crisis standards of care, individuals with disabilities mm -hmm. cannot be discriminated in a resource allocation crisis. Well, that's actually great that we were monitoring that clearly. Um, that is a very important issue. So that's really, really great. Yeah, definitely. And then the last um, bill I really want to specifically talk about was Senate Bill 1458, which is the speech pathology bill. 
Um, this is a piece of legislation that actually, similar to our 1092, was introduced in the 2020 session, but because of the pandemic, you know, closing everything down in 2020, it never made it through. Uh, so like a lot right. of different things. So that bill was brought back in, um, uh, was reintroduced this year. We uh, worked with the stakeholders on that bill. We uh, actually uh, were able to bring in the stakeholders, the speech pathologists, um, the hearing aid dispensers, and some other individuals and kind of did an introduction and had some several stakeholder meetings about um, just the efficiency and reducing the bureaucracy related to speech pathology and audiology and hearing aid dispensers. But um, one of the things that we also made sure of is in the legislation, it gave us an opportunity to change some really outdated terminologies. Um, the, the current statute had the words hearing impaired. And so this provided us an opportunity to change that language to individuals um, who are deaf or hard of hearing or have varying hearing loss. So, uh, you know, when we see those things, Wonderful. yeah, it, you know, and it's those little things that when we see them, we try to take the opportunity to make those what's called technical change. So, but uh, that that's also a bill that um, we monitored closely and uh, assisted and facilitated some conversations for, for folks in our community, our service providers mostly on that. And I know this uh, it does not stop here. There's a lot of other bills and a lot of other, you know, things that we've been, that we've been tracking. It's been a very, very busy session, especially with the impact of the pandemic and COVID last year. But thank you so much for sharing what you have. It's super helpful information, and I'm looking forward to seeing what comes from it. Yeah, me too. Now, let's go ahead and jump into the flat tax rate. This bill seems to have uh, maybe SB, HB, and, and just some other parts and features of this. Can you talk to us about how this affects us as a state and the county level as well? And when will this take effect? Yes, so I'm going to do my best um, to explain this. And I'll, I'll be honest, I'm gonna actually refer to some notes I have on this. So if you see me looking down, I'm trying not to be rude. I just want to present the most accurate information um, about this because it's a really big change in our tax structure in Arizona. Um, and I think it's important for folks to, to try to understand as much as we can. So I'm going to, I'll chunk this out. Okay. I think that's the best way to do this. <laughs> yep. Okay. Sounds so, good. <laughs> Great. So first, um, the initially the bill um, was called the tax omnibus bill, meaning it was a really comprehensive bill dealing with changes in our state tax structure. Um, as it went through the legislative process, the bill was uh, replaced with its twin bill in the Senate. And so it's known now as Senate Bill 1828. And that's the bill number that was chaptered, meaning it will become in effect. Um, okay. This bill did several things. Um, it dealt with contributions to public schools. So, you know, when you do your tax filings at the state, you can contribute. Um, like 200, 400, some odd dollars to get a tax credit. So this bill deals with that. Um, it dealt with corporate filings and how much their structure of filing was passed through um, as, you know, an LLC or what's called an S Corp. And also dealt with tax levies from county fire districts. 
Um, and it also dealt with shared revenue um, with the local cities and towns. So to kind of help understand how big this bill was, it dealt with a lot. But <clears throat> specifically, um, let's kind of like talk about the impacts on the tax structure. So right now in Arizona, um, individuals income taxes are in four tiers. Um, in starting in 2022, um, Arizona is going to move to a two-tier tax structure. So we're going to drop two, two of those structures. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so in so in 2022, the two tier track, the two tier tax structure um, is going to be 2.55% for single filers or those who are married but filing separate from their spouse with a taxable income less than 27,000. $282. Okay, so that's the first tax structure. Does that make sense? Okay. Yep. Okay. Following. Mm -hmm. So the second tax a tier under the new plan is those who are married filing jointly and or head of household with a taxable income less than or equal to $54,540,000, okay? So, th like, they're going to be, their tax structure, those, those groups of people, their tax structure is going to be 2.55%, okay? So... Yeah. Okay. So, and then it goes, it's 2.98% um, for single married filing separate if you make $27,273. So it's, what we're doing is taking four and combining it into two based off where you fall in your income and whether you, how you file. Um, I actually found a chart that takes someone's salary and how they file. Um, and so you, those folks, you know, if you're interested, I'm going to put this actually in my email news, the email newsletter version of this. So folks can look at their income and then see how much savings they'll get from this change in tax structure. Okay. So, cause I think visually seeing it where you fall helps people understand, right? Yeah. Don't you much. agree? Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I mean, I'm definitely gonna be one of the first people to pull up the email and look at the chart. <laughs> I'm a very visual person. I think that's gonna be a really useful tool to be able to help me understand what's happening after it takes effect in 2022. Yeah, I mean, same for me. I had to look at it. I'm like, so what does this mean for me? Now, one of the things that also to think about with this is that um, the majority of people who fall into the new structure, like 95% of tax filers will only see a reduction of like anywhere from $4 to $200. So you're not really gonna potentially see much change in your tax filings on this. However, um, okay. Okay. where, where it really has an impact is on the on the higher end, the 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 higher earners, the people who make the big bucks. They'll see a little bit more on, um, uh, you know, more of a benefit from the tax structure, um, and that and that's. Um, 
you know, where you'll see in the chart, you know, so they pay more, so they're going to see more benefit. If you make less, you're going to see um, the same or just a slight difference in your taxable income adjustment for that. But the other piece of this on that change of tax structure is related to the shared revenue. So there is a trigger in this legislation that says in 2023, if the general, the state general revenue hits like $12.8 billion, then the tax structure can get moved down to, I think it's 2.53%. So two, like two tenths or two hundredths or something like that reduction. Um, and then it gets, and then that's where it'll go through. And that was kind of the compromise on this bill because of the shared revenue impacts that it'll have on cities um, and towns. Um, they're they're going to be mostly impacted by this if the revenues don't come in um, in that shared revenue. And so cities and towns talked about how they may have to find alternative ways to ensure that they have, you know, the same levels of revenue. Um, does that make sense? It is really interesting. Yeah, definitely. I'm learning a lot today from yeah. you um, and just kind of how this is going to be broken up and what it actually could really look like in the future. I think it's going to be really interesting to see how it pans out. Yeah, I think so too. Um, it, it's going to be interesting. And I think only time will tell if this is um, going to be successful for all of Arizona or is it, um, or will it be a flop? Who knows? You never know until you try, I guess, right? <laughs> yep, very true. Yeah, I guess we'll just have to try and see. We'll keep our fingers crossed and see where it takes us. Definitely. Now, I do actually want to talk a little bit about the controversy around this. So um, I think you and I were talking previously around that you had heard um, something about the impacts on schools. Do you do you want to tell folks what you're what you were asking me? Yeah. There's honestly been a lot of things that have kind of come up over the past year. Um, and so I, if you could just refresh me about the one specific to the schools, I do remember um, something related to the voting approval and the education funding and the bills related to that. So maybe you could just touch on that for a minute. Very much so. Um, so one of the things around this is the impact that the flat tax will have on the voter approved Prop 208. So if you recall the last election, Prop 208 was a voter initiative, meaning that the voters passed into law um, a funding formula to that would require the top earners, the top businesses um, in Arizona to pay a percentage of that taxable income of their business. And that funding is obligated to go to public education. Um, and it was the a grassroots or you know uh, yeah. you know movement about, funding education in Arizona. So yeah. some of the opponents of the flat tax bill state that this legislation essentially guts that voter education, um, Prop 208 uh, voter approved bill. So um, because of how in the tax bill, the highest cap is 4.5%, and that includes the 3.5% that was supposed to be taxed to those higher earners of 500,000 or more, I believe is the number, um, to fund that education. So this essentially said, how I understand it is, it's gonna be 4.5 and we're gonna wrap that 3.5% over its Prop 2A and put it in that 4.5. So, 
it, it's it, it's how they did it. And, you know, I'm going to make sure I go on record. I'm not an accountant. So like <laughs> these percentages, I'm like, ah, but, um, <laughs> um, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. It's complicated. Yeah. Like this is why we pay people to do these things. Right. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I'm not a math genius. I'm not. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm right there with you. <laughs> um, but that's where something that's kind of, um, important to say is that they're those the prop 208 folks are actually looking at doing another voter initiative coming out this next election uh to halt this flat tax plan um and so it'll be interesting to see what happens will this flat tax plan be overturned by the voters um, will it go through? So I think it's pretty much anyone's kind of guess at this point what's going to actually happen with it. Wow. There's a there's a lot of thoughts going on in my head right now, <laughs> but we're not going to go into that. Uh, I'm curious about the impacts of this on the deaf, hard of hearing, and deaf blind education system and what that's going to look like for us. So time will tell, right? Yeah, and I think that we have to kind of make sure that we're clear that this is not going to necessarily have an impact on ASDB because ASDB um, has... Uh, several different funding sources, including the fact that we have to remember ASDB is constitutionally protected in a different way um, and how they operate in their funding structure um, is a little bit different from a traditional um, LEA, even with the passage of HB 2863, it's not going to, it's going to impact the funding structure for ASDB because it's going to open up their ability to to, uh, to funds that were, you know, um, technically not available to them. Um, but this is going to be interesting for those end of, for those students who are deaf and hard of hearing who, and deaf blind, who go through charter schools and through the public school, the school districts. So this is, that's where, because special education, that's a whole other avenue. Special education in our state is not fully funded. Um, and that's that's a whole other thing that came out uh, at this legislative session was the funding um, problems related to special education services, um, to early intervention services, to DVD, to vulnerable. So there's a lot of different funding conversations happening that are going on right now. Yeah, wow. This is a lot of, of, of heavy information. There's a lot to, to work through and to talk about. And so I'm glad that we monitor this and that we have this avail available for our community um, and that we're gonna keep, keep an eye on it in the, in the time to come. You are a busy lady. <laughs> Okay, now let's talk about some of these voting bills. I've noticed that there have been several bills related to voting and it, it seems kind of like a whirlwind and a little bit confusing and knowing how it will impact us and uh, how is this gonna impact the, the voting process in 2022? Yeah, so there was over 127 election voter related bills this session. So it was intense um, to monitor what's going on. So, I mean, we obviously did not go into all 127 bills in our weekly legislative updates and monitoring, um, but we did follow a couple that we did. Um, one was Senate Bill 1003. Um, this bill um, on the surface seems really, um, you know, benign. It's It requires a voter who failed to um, include their signature on their early ballot envelope to um, correct the signature um, by 7 p.m. on election day. 
in order for that ballot to count. So it seems pretty simple. Um, however, we felt that this was going to directly have an impact on the deaf, hard of hearing, and deafblind um, community, the disability community as a whole, actually. Uh, did not like this bill. Um, and that's mostly because when you think about the, you you get contacted by the county. So the county would call you, for example, back and says, hey, did you vote an early ballot? Your signature doesn't match or you forgot to sign it. You need to get here by 7 p.m. to correct this. Um, and, but how does that work for someone who's deaf, hard of hearing, or deaf blind, right? Like if you, you, you know, it's, yeah, you're going to call, right? You'll call back, but you're going to encounter a phone tree. If you're utilizing relay um, services, you know, and so we all know, we know in our world yeah. how phone trees are barriers, you know, to effective communication, right? Like they're challenging. Yes, <laughs> very, very much so. So we try to explain like this very simple thing. It's not about providing the signature. It's about how are you going to do that in a very short amount of time when in a normal day to day, a phone tree through a government agency is one of the hardest, most challenging things for the community, right? For sure. I mean, it's already challenging in our everyday lives, and that kind of situation just intensifies it that much more. Exactly. So I'll let you all know right now, if you are an early voter, which I hope you all are, um, to, our, to our community, please make sure that you sign your envelope and make sure that that signature matches. Um, and you know, sign up for early notifications because through text message, um, several, I know Maricopa County, for example, has a text notification system, but that's not the case for all counties in Arizona. So that's just something put on your guys's radar. Yeah. yeah. That is a great tool that I've been using is the texting system. And it's really cool because it, kind of gives me some security to know that they received my registration or they got my ballot and whatnot. So I really am fully engaged in participating in that. That's been really, really nice. And we hope that other counties obviously follow suit with that, uh, with what Maricopa County has been doing. Yeah. Okay. So I want to talk about this other thing, this zombie bill. What is this? What is that term? I'm not familiar with it by any means and what it means in the legislative world. So can you talk about that? Yes. So we, a zombie bill is exactly like what it kind of sounds like, um, right? A zombie is something or a person that just refuses to die and it keeps coming back to life, right? So it's a take on that, um, meaning that there is a bill that, as it goes through the legislative process, keeps finding its way through all the technical loopholes to, re to live again. And we actually had a bill. Um, it was Bill 7. It ended up being... Senate Bill 1485. Uh, this was a voting bill that started off as a different bill number. Completely, um, uh, it went through, passed through committee, got through the Senate, um, and then transferred over to the House, passed out of the House committee, but then it died on the House floor, meaning debt, that bill, debt. Um, well, it then resurfaced, um, on another bill, Senate Bill 1485, um, back in the Senate on a bill. So now this is where the legislative process gets funky. So you can have a bill 
like Senate Bill 1485, that has nothing to do with the original bill of the zombie bill. It can go through all the process, go through the Senate, go over to the House, get to the Senate, and then come back. And then you can add on to it at that time for a final vote. Or it can do what this bill did, which was, this was a bill that had made it through one chamber and then went to the other chamber. And then it was added on as an, um, what we call an amendment in that chamber. And so then it was voted on and passed and then voted on again. Um, and it was signed into law. So that's what why we call it the zombie bill because if it can die and remember, a bill language dying means it, it stopped. It didn't get the votes. It, it can't move forward. That's what we mean by a bill dying. And this bill kept finding all the different ways to, to live another day. And it did. <laughs> and it was signed into law by the government. So, okay. Okay. I mean, so then that means that just the normal kind of day-to-day -day business with bills, this could be happening all the time, right? This is not a new concept. Maybe a bill will die and then it comes up somewhere else and they just kind of circle back and forth from chamber to chamber and this can happen. <laughs> that gives me a little bit of clarity, I guess. Yes, exactly. And it can happen on any bill. And so um, oftentimes zombie bills come up as what we call strikers. Um, and so zombie bills, a striker, and that's what 1485 was, is that it was a striker and, um, it replaced another bill and took its place. So, yeah. Okay. That makes sense. I think that's, you know, as clear as mud can be. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> It, and it's what makes the job a little bit more nuanced that people, I think people don't understand is that um, I think that's also where folks get frustrated with the political system is that there's all these kind of loopholes um, where legislation can find. And, you know, that can be good if it's something that you are supportive of. But, you know, if you're not supportive of that kind of legislation, then you get frustrated with it. But, um, you know, that's, it's what's allowed in our constitution, our state constitution, in our rules. We need like a 101 constitution class of, or relearn what we learned way back <laughs> in the day. <laughs> and then maybe we'd have some more involvement in the legislative process, right? Right, exactly. Well, we can do that for the future. But, but yeah. I do want to talk about what 1485 does and the impacts on the community um, is that in Arizona for the last 20 plus years, we have had what's called the permanent early voting list, also known as PEVL. And this bill actually eliminates the terminology of what we know as the permanent early voting list. And it changes it to active voter list. And that and here's why. Because what this bill says is that if you fail to vote by mail early, you have to vote by mail you have to vote early for all elections in a in two consecutive two consecutive election cycles. So meaning for two years, you have to vote in every election by mail and early to stay on the active voter list. If you do not vote, in one of those elections, then the county has to provide you notice in writing it by text or by phone 
that you're going to be dropped from the active voter list. If you as the voter fail to engage the contact the con the county recorder's office, then the county recorder must drop you from the early from the active early voter, which means you will have to either request an early ballot, a one-time early ballot, get yourself back on the early voter list, or go to the polls to vote on election day. Wow. I mean, it's interesting, but looking at how this impacts the disability community in general and how this is creating more barriers, what are your thoughts there? Um, I have lots of thoughts. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think it, it, this is the part where we're going to have to continue to do our advocacy as a, not just from ACDHH, but where the community really needs to come in um, and engage their county recorder's office and the board of supervisors at their counties about how information needs to be made accessible. Um, talking about what that means, um, having it in, you know, that kind of information in, in a format that is fully accessible to the community that we serve. Um, you know, we, of course, at ACDHH are gonna do whatever we can to provide um, accurate and accessible voter education so folks know um, to vote uh, in their elections. But I, I have concerns. Um, you know, not every person is, I should say, not every voter is going to vote in every election. I mean, I know I'm a nerd. I vote in every single election. I vote in my SRP board elections. I mean, who requests the ballot for their SRP board elections? I do. But I'm a nerd. I'm, an, I'm a voting nerd. <laughs> so, I mean, that's what it is. And now, mind you, at the special taxing districts don't fall into this bill, but what if you don't want to vote? Maybe you're not feeling a race. Um, this bill says that that's fine. You don't have to vote in that race, but you're going to be dropped from the list. So that means for our community that you have to stay diligent and constantly check your voter registration status, constantly making sure that you're on the active voter list, constantly needing to make sure that you request your early ballot. Because we've talked about this, right? Just yesterday we were talking about this. The polls are frustrating for our communities. Going to the poll is not an enjoyable experience for, right, if you're deaf and hard of hearing or deafblind voter. It's just, it's not fun. But you have the right to vote. If you are eligible to vote, you should be able to vote. Right. That's exactly it. You know, I'm just thinking like on a personal level, what does this do to me? Um, you know, I do believe in trying to vote in every election that I can, but if out of the blue, I just, something happens in 2022 or 2024, and I decide that I don't want to vote, and I have to vote every two years in every single election, and then if I don't, I'm booted out, and then they have to contact me, and then I have to contact them back, and like to be able to be considered an active voter, like this whole process is really, wow, like, you know, why can't they just leave me to have autonomy in these decisions, right? Like, let me pick what I want to do and leave me on the list. It's an interesting approach and in, in why they've chosen to do this. You know, um, it is interesting. Now, if I'm going to play devil's advocate to this, there is also, though, this responsibility of that voting by mail costs money. It's expensive. So to send out a ballot to every person who's requested and they're not going to vote it, that costs you as a taxpayer. So, I mean, if I'm going to play the other side, there's a responsibility in that. And so, um, you know, it, it's, yes. but still at the end of the day, I, I agree. Like if you're an early voter, you shouldn't be forced to, but there are repercussions and r running elections are expensive and it's not just a piece of paper. Um, 
uh, you know, there's postage, there's lots of other costs that are associated with this. So you're not removed as a voter, you're just removed from the voting list. But it does create additional, potentially some additional barriers. And we just have to make sure, Becca, that in this upcoming election, that's when the clock starts counting on this. So we're going to have to make sure that we educate the community to uh, be active in their voter registration. Betty, I mean, I can't thank you enough for showing that opposite perspective here and playing devil's advocate for a minute because, you know, I didn't even think of how those costs can tally up. And it's always important to look at mm -hmm. the other side of things because it, we're quick to say, oh, you're, you're creating a barrier for me, but it's so nice to hear the other side of that. So thank you. Hey, you're welcome. Okay, so now let's talk about towards the end of the legislative session, there was a lot of talk about this budget and how long the delay was. So can you talk about that and what was the delay all about? Um, yes, I, I can certainly talk about that. So um, I don't know, Becca, if you remember Early on in the legislative session, I had uh, talked about and wrote in the newsletter that the budget is the one thing that the state legislature is constitutionally required to do. Um, they are not required to do all this other stuff. They are only required in our constitution to pass a budget. And so... Typically what happens in the legislative session is that once we get a budget, we know that we're going to, we're wrapping up the session and we know we're close to sign e die. Well, here's the thing what that happened this year is you have to have a majority of votes to pass legislation. And in the House, you have to have 31 votes. And in the Senate, you need 16 votes. So the, the vote margins are really tight. So in the Senate, where the majority has exactly 16 Republicans to pass something, if one Republican decides to say no, it stops right? Because then that's, you don't have majority. And it's the same over in the Senate. You have very, you know, your margins are so small. So when you have the majority party has to negotiate with their, their members, their caucus. Um, and so if you have someone coming out saying, I'm not going to vote for that, um, unless I see this get changed, then you're going to see leadership try to negotiate um, with those members in, in their caucus. Now, this is what happened. Um, you know, leadership could have tried to negotiate with the Democrats um, to get their, their votes, but they chose not to. Instead, they chose to negotiate within their own, um, their own members. So what kind of stalled the budget is, and we kind of need to take a step back here, is there are 11 budget bills if you included the tax bill. So we had the K through 12 education bill. We had the environment bill. We had the criminal justice budget bill. We had higher education budget bill. We had the general appropriations bill. We had the revenue bill. Um, I mean, there's 11 different budget bills. <clears throat> so there were members okay. who in each, like in the, in the higher education a budget bill, there was language around um, vaccinations or mask mandates. The, that was the same with the K through 12 bill. And so you had members that said, no, you, you cannot, I want that language stripped out. Um, there, the original uh, education bill said that 
the discretion of mass mandates would be left to the local school boards. Well, that didn't work. So they struck that language and instead changed it and said no mass mandates can be had. So they were able to get support for that education budget for that. <clears throat> and that's the same thing that we saw um, in the criminal justice bill. We also saw it in um, the, it was in the criminal justice bill, the higher education bill, the K through 12 budget bill. And then um, we also, the general state budget uh, had some negotiations. So, yeah, that's what took forever. It's like if you don't have um, if you don't have consensus in that, and on top of all that, we are. I don't know if you remember in June, our whole state was on fire. We had fires everywhere um, happening in our state. Yes, right. Yeah, and so we had a legislative member um, whose community he represents Globe. His, his community was on fire and he was like, I'm not going to vote on a budget while my, my community is on fire. Right. Um, we need help. Um, and so there was also, uh, and then, so there was some things like that, uh, you know, about the fire suppression, but that member was also opposed to the tax, the flat tax bill. So there had to be some negotiations on that as well. So, yeah, you saw a lot of bartering and negotiation happening with the budgets. Wow. Wow. I didn't realize that we had 11 budget bills. I mean, I knew that there were several, but not 11. There's just a lot of hands in the pot, right? Like you said, there's negotiations and somebody's opposed to this. And there's just a lot of things happening behind the scenes. And to be able to see the big picture on, on why and what caused the delay is really interesting. Okay, so let's actually, uh, if there's nothing else that you wanna talk about the fire suppression bill, um, then maybe we can move on to the unemployment um, related to the benefits or the insurance. That part is not incredibly clear to me. So if you wanna talk about that, that would be great. Sure, we can definitely talk about the unemployment. Um, so, when we first started out um, in the beginning of the legislation, uh, legislative session, um, there were two unemployment bills that were dropped. One from the House, which was Representative Cook from LD, um, I believe he's LD8, I could be, you know. Um, and then the second one was Senate uh, President Fan um, over in the Senate. And they each, each of the unemployment bills did slightly different things, um, but Essentially, the tenets of each of those bills uh, were similar, is that there was increasing the unemployment benefits in Arizona. Because um, I don't know um, if you know this, but we're like one of like, we're in like the bottom 47th or 48th state in our unemployment benefits. And so our cost of living has increased, but our unemployment benefits have stayed the same for like 17 years. So, um, and while unemployment is not meant to be, you know, you're not supposed to be able to live off it, you're, it's just a stopgap um, to help until you can get future employment, right? So we realized out of the COVID pandemic, once again, we made us, you know, open, look in the mirror and go, oh my gosh, like we've, there's a lot that we've got to fix. Um, for our community and unemployment was one of them. And so what ended up happening with unemployment was that the, those bills, the language of those two bills were put together and then put into the budget bill. So we saw an actual one of the budgets, um, the budget reconciliation bills, the language increasing unemployment benefits to $320 a week. So that will be an increase of $60 um, from what it is right now. Um, and, but here's the catch. Right now you get it for 26 weeks. So you get an increase, but then you're gonna be deduct deducted to 24 weeks. So, 
you get $320, but only for 24 weeks. Okay. Here's the other caveat to this. It does not start until, let me, I'm going to clarify this, July 1st, 2022. So people who are on unemployment right now are not going to see the increase during their unemployment phase. It's going to be folks um, who are on employment next year. I mean, and there's a lot of other like technical stuff for corporations. Mm -hmm. So I know we actually have a lot of deaf business owners, um, you know, and hard of hearing business owners in our community. So if they, if anybody in our, who's watching, who is a business owner wants to know more information about that related to their um, payment into unemployment, give us a call, send us an email. Um, we can direct them to the, um, to the, the correct resources on the impacts for them. Okay. Very cool. This is great information to know. And I think it's a great segue into us wrapping up our interview. Uh, thank you so much for all the things. I know that there's no possible way to fit it all in in, in one interview. There's just been so, more, so much work that you've done. And so how can you tell us how we can kind of engage the community members, the deaf, deaf, blind, hard of hearing community? And is there any, maybe any other stakeholders, parents of deaf, hard of hearing, deaf, blind children? And the list goes on, right? How we can be more involved and engaged in this process in the legislative world, all of it. Mm -hmm. um, any tips from you or ideas that you might have for us? Yeah, I think um, there, I'll, I have several different ideas. I mean, and, and I think that, you know, we talked about this too, is first, you know, I think it's about uh, learning the process. Um, we're here, right? Like you and I are here to help um, get folks to, you know, understand, uh, you know, what it, what the legislative process means. I would love for more folks to reach out, um, ask more questions. Uh, I think one of the things is if you don't understand, you know, we're here to help. It, it's a complicated system. I mean, it shouldn't be, but it can be. Um, and I and I think that, you know, the the biggest thing is we're also here to help our community members and our stakeholders understand and 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 help them. Um, reach out to their state legislator or their elected officials. Um, you know, you don't have to take a position on, I mean, if you have a position on a bill, let me say, um, even if it's differing from what the commission, um, you know, supports or is against, you have the right to engage your legislature and we're here to help you uh, navigate that. So you can meet with your legislature, you can talk with them about something um, and I really encourage you uh, to take um, an interest in lots of different pieces of legislation, right? Like, so that's, you know, those are a couple of things that I think folks can do. And sign up for our newsletter and our video updates, <laughs> right? Yes, yes. Thank you so much, Betty, for all of this information. Um, it's been very enlightening. Thank you for making this recap of this past legislative session. And we're looking forward to next year and being a bit more involved. It's very exciting. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And Becca, I really appreciate you taking the time um, out of your day to join me in this last um, video update for this uh, legislative session. Uh, it was the third longest session in the state's history since we recorded. So it's been a long ride. Third, was, most, yeah. right? It was done all virtually this year. So hopefully uh, next year uh, you would join me again and having, uh, you know, talks like this. So. Thank you. Yes, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. And thank you everybody for following us along this legislative session. We really appreciate it. And as always, if you have any questions 
or would like to learn more, please uh, contact us at info at acdhh.az.gov, or you can give us a, a follow at any of our social media accounts on Facebook, uh, Instagram, or Twitter. Talk to you soon.